Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Growing more with less is the mantra of Nebraska's corn farmers, and they're using incredible technology to do it. Soil moisture monitors let them know when their crop needs water and how much. GPS systems eliminate overlaps in the field, saving fuel and money. New hybrids reduce the use of pesticides and increase yields. When you're talking new technology and innovation, Nebraska corn farmers are all ears. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board and the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, John Moret looks at the USDA's May crop report. Tamara Jackson Zims explains why corn growers may see diseases popping up. Bob Wright describes how farmers can scout their corn for insect damage. And we show you how the Japanese market uses imported corn and soybeans. Nebraska has recorded its first case of avian influenza. The Nebraska Department of Agriculture said Tuesday a commercial layer flock of 1.7 million chickens in Dixon County in northeast Nebraska was confirmed to have the H5N2 avian flu and has now been quarantined. The birds will be euthanized. Governor Pete Ricketts has declared a state of emergency, which will provide the state with resources to track and further contain the virus. The USDA says proper handling of poultry and cooking meat and eggs to 165 degrees will kill bacteria and viruses, including the avian flu. The virus strains have so far affected more than 33 million birds across the United States. John Moret from J.E. Moret Grain Company is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. The USDA released its May crop report Tuesday, revealing the first estimates on the sizes of this year's corn and soybean crops. The agency believes U.S. farmers will harvest 13.6 billion bushels of corn on an average yield of 166.8 bushels per acre. It's projecting growers to produce 3.85 billion bushels of soybeans with an average yield of 46 bushels per acre. We talked with John Wednesday afternoon near Pierce about the USDA's numbers, cash targets for old crop corn, and avian flu impact locally. To start, we asked John for an update on planting progress and moisture conditions in his area of northeast Nebraska. You know, planting, Jeff, flew right along this spring. I think guys were uh, easy to get to the field. The dirt worked up really nice until about last week. We saw a little rain come through, which answers your second question. We, we've saturated the soils a little bit and kind of put the planting on hold. Today's Wednesday, we're back in putting some soybeans in, but the forecast is damp tonight and then cool into next week. And so people aren't quite as gung-ho as they were last week and the week before with their, with their planning progress. But overall, I'd say the farmer's pretty happy with it, Jeff. Let's talk about the USDA crop report released on Tuesday. Let's start in soybeans, and that's where the market really reacted. Uh, in old crop stocks, were lower to 350 million bushels and new crop at 500. Why did the market react so strongly to that? Well, it's all perception. I think people were ready for a tighter bean number than that. And so when we saw the 350, you caught the market, market off guard a little bit. The 500 next year was somewhat anticipated, but I, I think going into it, people had covered their positions and were long a few beans. And so when the numbers came out, we rolled over and, and punished beans down 17 or 18 cents. So I, I'm not sure it's long-term friendly, Jeff, but it's certainly a, a little bit of a correction yesterday. Overall, the stocks numbers in corn and beans, are they bigger than you thought they were going to be? They're both bigger. They're both bigger. And the world stocks are growing, Jeff. And so the problem isn't just what the U.S. has, it's the world stocks. And if we continue to have good weather around the world, we're going to continue to build stocks. Tell me what that means, that the world stocks are so big, meaning what locally? You know, less demand, less demand for the grain we have. And so anytime you have a surplus, you have to find somebody to get rid of it. And so exports generally on beans are gonna pull 70, 80% of them out of the country. And so if you can get that done, you can get rid of the surplus. If you have competition with Argentina and Brazil, it's gonna have a harder time getting rid of the surplus there. And same with corn. You know, anytime you have over about a billion five corn, you need to be exporting. And this year we're forecast to have a little over that. We need to be exporting corn. Of that old crop corn, how much do you think is still left in Nebraska? Quite a bit, 
there's quite a bit. Nebraska, Nebraska's got some grain around, especially on the farm. I think we need to get moving and pay attention to where it's at and how we're going to get rid of it. So, what cash price would you be willing to do that at? I'm a I'm a seller. If we can get back to 375 cash today, we're about three and a half cash, and so we need a little work. We need a little rally, and if we get it, I think the guy needs to to move forward and sell some. Realistically, where does it move from? Because corn has been very very stagnant lately. It's it's a dead duck, and the funds are short are short now, right? Yeah. Yes, they are. So, are you uh, also? bearish in corn or I'm not, bullish? I'm not short term. I think you've got too many people um, that want to sell it off and call the call the crop done and I don't think we're right there. I think a stat yesterday I saw says that 90 percent of your yield is going to be decided in July with uh, temperatures and precip and so until we see that July weather or even sniff it I don't think you can sell this thing off. Are you positive in soybeans as well? I'm not. I think beans are, are over uh, overdone to the high side. I think we've got a little bit of a squeeze going on in the May July soybeans. Mm -hmm. Maize off the board tomorrow. Once that happens, I think we relax. I think beans are going to see 50 cents of pressure and corn can have a 20 cent rally. Tell me locally how the uh, avian flu is impacting. We learned this week that uh, a flock in northeast Nebraska broke in Dixon County. That's kind of your area here. Is that a big deal for demand? Well, I think it's a really big deal and, and not, not just the lost demand in the chickens, Jeff, or in the turkeys in our case, but I think it's a problem with where does the corn in that area go then? And we've seen Mexico stand up in the last 10 days and say they don't want to take corn from the infected areas. We've seen the Japanese say the same thing. So I think that's the bigger problem is what does it do to the world buyer? And if he says, I'm not willing to take that corn in an infected area, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. What does basis look like right now? Firm, Jeff. You know, guys are fed up with the price. Uh, we've been, been nothing but soft all spring here. Um, so bases, uh, if we lose 20 cents on the board, we'll take 10 of it back in bases here. So very firm seasonally. As you start to look at that new crop in corn, what prices are attractive right now, if anything? You, you're below your spring price, okay? So you're below your insurance price. I think if you can be patient with your new crop, you can. You can afford to do that for a little bit here. However, you get back above the $4 board, I think you have to re-engage yourself and, and start selling again. Does the same aggressiveness go for 2016? Yes. Yes, although a little more cautiously. Okay. We don't know where inputs are for 16. We don't know where fertilizer's at. We don't know where fuel will be at. And so until you get a couple of those things nailed down, I don't know that I'd take a chance on the 16. You're more patient then? A lot more patient. Okay, how about soybeans as for 2015? Sell them. You're ready. Sell them. That's easy, Jeff. Because? That's easy. You know, I've been bearish for a long time. You look at the world stocks. You look at the South American stocks specifically. You look at the Chinese buyer that's going to buy in a different fashion than he has the last five years. He's going to be more patient. He can see there's a big crop. He knows that he can wait until 30 or 40 days before and still buy his position. Two years ago, he had to get his spot in line if he wanted to get the soybeans. So I think you're going to see a different kind of market in soybeans this year. Next week, University of Missouri Extension economist Ron Plain will join us to analyze hog markets. Nebraska's farmers have planted more than three-fourths of this year's corn crop, but the drastic variation in weather conditions is putting different challenges in front of the state's growers. Earlier this week in a greenhouse on East Campus, we talked with Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson-Zims to learn about emerging disease issues farmers should be aware of. We started by asking Tamara about the varying environments across the state. Well, of course, in the southeast part of the state, we've had some tremendous flooding, a lot of saturated soils. But in other parts of the state, we're getting over some droughty conditions. And then, of course, when you look out west, very cold and even some snow to talk about. And so a lot of plant stress going on right now. Let's talk about those situations individually. Let's start with waterlogged or ponded or flooded fields. What could be some of the problems that farmers might be seeing in those uh, conditions? Well, in the saturated soils, there are some disease conditions I hope people will be on the lookout for. And we recommend scouting fields and making sure that you're having good plant emergence, especially in corn right now, and that you're getting good stand establishment. And so these uh, stressful conditions, and especially wet conditions, can promote pythium damping off both before emergence and after emergence. And so I would focus on those areas, especially where water has been uh, sitting for a little longer. and. Uh, when should you start to be concerned in terms of your stand coming up and seeing some holes in there? You know, if you haven't seen plant emergence after a couple of weeks, I'd be watching it very close. And, and you know, people know their field conditions better than we can predict them. And so you know where some of your problem spots are. And so I would focus on those areas, especially and where you've had a disease problem in the past or where you tend to see ponding. How about in those drought conditions? Are there things that you might see there that you wouldn't necessarily see in uh, more saturated conditions? 
Absolutely. There are some diseases that actually are favored by dry conditions. And so certain pathogens like rhizoctonia, you can still see seedling diseases even where you haven't had saturated soils. And so no matter what the stressful conditions are, you should still continue to scout those fields. How often will farmers be able to identify these in their fields and how often should they send them in for diagnosis? Well, if you have any doubt, you can always send it into the plant and pest diagnostic clinic for a diagnosis. But realistically, for corn, where we can't always add another seed treatment fungicide if you had to replant, it, it's a good idea to identify seedling diseases in general, but I don't think it's that important if we can differentiate between them at this stage. So what management options do exist, either short term or long term? Well, short term, if the stand establishment, your poor stand is bad enough, if you had to replant, often conditions have changed in the few days between the first time you planted and the second time that the disease may not be a problem the second time. And so that would be something that I would, I would count on usually. And of course, if it's pythium, you know, wet conditions are going to favor that. If it's rhizoctonia, dry conditions. And so you can judge accordingly. And long term? Long term, you know, I might think about including that as part of my long-term management plan. And so if you know you have fields with pythium problems, maybe uh, plant those later on when we're not as, as wet or uh, try to avoid those wet conditions or vice versa. And so uh, adjusting planting order can often be enough to manage it. We'll link to more information on corn diseases and submission to UNL's Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic on the Market Journal website. Next week, Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Lauren Giesler will join us to look at soybean seedling diseases. The large precipitation events totaling up in certain areas of Nebraska have caused a problem for some livestock producers. Nebraska Extension's Amy Millmeyer schmidt says the wet weather pattern has led to runoffs in lagoons and holding ponds. Amy says even properly managed basins could have experienced overflows under these extreme events. In a case where more rainfall causes a problem like this in the future, Amy says a producer's main concern should be not allowing the liquid to come over the top of a berm. So if they, they do find themselves in a position where their basin is full and um, they're facing either having it over top or having to pump it, we recommend that they go ahead and pump onto saturated land, which normally wouldn't be a recommended practice. Um, in this case, we want to see them first pump onto ground that has a growing crop on it, if possible. Um, the next best thing would be to pump onto land that has some pretty significant residue remaining on it. And our last resort would be to pump onto um, bare soil. We do recommend that they contact their um, regional DEQ inspector prior to doing any um, pumping, just to get the go-ahead for that and, and see if there's any other recommendations that they have for them. Uh, but certainly it's allowable to have a discharge of that nature if they are operating under a permit and they've done all the management practices that are dictated by that permit and they have records to show that. Amy says in a situation where a producer is forced to pump onto saturated soils, even on top of crops or residue, they should choose sites with minimal slope and use greater setback distances from sensitive areas than they normally would. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to more resources on this topic, including notification information for the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality. The main Nebraska farmer says with lower grain prices expected through 2015, it's more important for producers to budget carefully and cut crop expenses without sacrificing yield. This month's magazine says it's not an easy task, but there are management aspects to monitor closely. For example, the largest expenses for corn producers are seed and fertilizer. For soybeans, it's seed. For wheat, it's fertilizer. You can read about some of these cost management aspects in the May issue of Nebraska Farmer, including monitoring irrigation equipment and setting realistic yield expectations. 30% of Nebraska's corn crop is now above ground, according to the latest USDA Crop Progress Report. That's 12 points ahead of the state's five-year average and a point better than the national emergence of 29%. Earlier this week, we talked with Nebraska Extension entomologist Bob Wright, who says growers can now begin scouting those emerged fields for insects, starting with cutworms. Well, as, as the corn emerges, every field should be scouted for early season insect injury, regardless of whether it was a BT corn or even had a seed treatment. Cutworms are something that if they're abundant enough, we can do something now and uh, try to save the crop before it's damaged anymore. And the, there's a couple of different types of cutworms we have in Nebraska. Some, several species overwinter as partly grown caterpillars 
and they can do a lot of damage quickly uh, as the plant emerges, so you want to be sure to scout as the corn emerges. The other major cutworm we have is the black cutworm, which doesn't overwinter in Nebraska, but the moth flies up each spring and lays its eggs. And as the, eggs ha the caterpillars hatch out, they initially feed on the leaves, and then as they get about half grown, they can get big enough to actually cut the plant at the ground level or below ground level. Regardless of the species, uh, check fields and look for cutting injury or leaf feeding. And How much damage yeah. would be a problem? Oh, about three to, f three to five percent injury is our threshold level uh, for cutworms, regardless of the species. And there's a variety of post-emergence insecticides that are effective if you have enough da damage to cause problems. What are some of the other insects that could be out there causing problems for farmers, but that you can't necessarily treat for? Okay, wireworms and white grubs are the two most common soil insects, and both of them can cause stand loss if they're abundant enough. So at this point, there's nothing, there's no post-emergence treatments, but we, if they're abundant enough, we may make, have to make a replant decision. And so that's what you'll be looking for now, is if there's enough stand loss, whether it be worth replanting that field. And that's how you're differentiating the problem between that and cutworms? Right, yeah, well, there's a post-emergence treatment for cutworms. There is no post-emergence insecticide treatments for uh, wireworms or white grubs. It's just a pl replant decision at this time. Uh, why is it so important to uh, specify the problem that you're having in these fields? Well, the one, one thing is, again, you don't want to use a post-emergence insecticide to try to cure wireworm white grub problems. Uh, that's the main issue. Uh, what decision are you making? How are you going to use the scouting information is the main point. Anything in soybeans that producers might be seeing out there right now? Well, they potentially can be injured by cutworms, wireworms, and white grubs, but typically they're less, less uh, affected. In terms of cutworms, uh, soybeans are more able to compensate for some stand loss than uh, corn is. And the same thing with the wire, wireworms and white grubs. The other issue is that typically soybeans are planted later and the wireworms and white grubs uh, cause more problems earlier than later in the season. So uh, typically we have less problems with soybeans, but there is potential in soybeans as well. Bob recently authored an article on scouting for these insects. It can be found on the CropWatch website. We'll also link to that information on the Market Journal homepage. As you saw in our previous episode of Market Journal, Japan is the most valuable market for U.S. pork and beef. But those aren't the only ag products it buys from U.S. producers. It's also the biggest buyer of American corn and wheat and the fourth largest purchaser of U.S. soybeans. When you see the Japanese countryside, it won't be hard to understand why Japan and the United States have developed a strong relationship in trading these three commodities. Japan's farmers are in the midst of planting their nation's most widely grown crop. These rice paddies throughout Japan account for more than half the country's farmland. On average, a producer here will only farm a few acres, a hundred times smaller than the average U.S. farmer. Very little wheat is grown here, even fewer soybeans and almost no corn. This has led to sustained trade with the world's largest corn producer. Japan has been the biggest buyer of U.S. corn in every year since 1990. It's used for mainly animal feed. Two-thirds of uh, the imported U.S. corn is used for animal and one-third is used for food production, including starch and corn grits production. Japan imports about 600 million bushels of corn each year. Even though it relies heavily on the U.S. for pork and beef, it does have its own domestic production of hogs and cattle, as well as poultry and dairy. Since it doesn't grow enough feed ingredients at home, it needs to bring them in. Historically, almost all of the corn for that came from the United States. We used to source nearly more than 95% from the United States, but uh, two, three years ago, we had a severe drought in the United States. So at the time, U.S. lost some share, and we buy uh, feed grain from the other South America or Ukraine as well. The USDA says the U.S. has bounced back from the 2012 drought, accounting for more than 90% of Japan's feed corn since May 2014. One sector consuming that corn is the Wagyu beef raised in southern Japan. Taking two and a half years to finish, these cattle can weigh 400 pounds more at slaughter than the average cow produced in the U.S. But Wagyu beef is known for its heavy marbling, and buyers in Japan are willing to pay a premium for it. The USDA says the bargain sale price for Wagyu sirloin in 2013 was $44 a pound. 
choice sirloin steak in the U.S. now goes for more than $8 a pound. While also maintaining a place in livestock diets, soybeans have held a constant place in human consumption. Soybean is a many difference in a crushed oil, oil purpose and uh, our traditional food, tofu or miso, natto, such a protein food. The soybean is very essential part of Japanese culture, so uh, it's very, we, we need every day. Uh, but the uh, consumer really uh, don't realize that uh, uh, soybean is for uh, imp I mean, imported soybean. In 1955, Japan became the leading export market for U.S. soybeans and was its biggest buyer for many years. Japanese consumers value the protein component in soybeans, using them in foods like soy sauce, soy milk, tofu or soybean curd, and soybean paste, foods many Japanese eat every day. Soybean paste, or miso, is made with soybeans, rice, and salt. The beans come from the U.S., Canada, and Brazil, and are all non-GMO. In fact, the companies we visited for tofu, soy milk, and miso all said the soybeans they used were non-GMO, and customers preferred it that way. The soybean oil crushed at J Oil Mills in Chiba, Japan, does come from genetically modified beans, and the company says the requests for non-GMO are few. Frankly, the discussion about biotechnology in Japan echoes the desire we told you about last week. Consumers want to know more about where their food comes from. In Tokyo, Tetsuo Hamamoto says the U.S. Grains Council has brought U.S. farmers into the country to talk directly with consumers who have questions. They really, really like that kind of opportunities. Not only you know, the quality, not only the price, but those kind of uh, relationships really, really work the Japan, the Japanese customers, and keep them in keeping them uh, loyal to the U.S. grain. In U.S. agricultural exports to Japan, the loyalty of this country cannot be clearer than when looking at corn. Since 1990, Japan has been the leading buyer of U.S. corn. It's been the top destination for so long, the number one importer in 1989 was a country that no longer exists, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Masahiko Okita of Atochu says while the rest of the continent may be growing, this market should remain important to U.S. producers. The U.S. is very important uh, because... Uh, some other Asian countries' demand is increased, and they are trying to buy more, many products. But uh, uh, I hope, you know, uh, U.S. grower doesn't forget the Japanese market as well. <laughs> Our continuing coverage from Japan can be found under the MJ Extras tab on the Market Journal website, including our report detailing Nebraska's pork and beef exports to Japan we aired on our previous episode. Next week, we'll look at how the Trans-Pacific Partnership could impact trade between the United States and Japan. Now, with this week's weather outlook, here's Tony Cooper from the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Soil temps remain in a permanent groundhog day, and rains kept everyone's bottom soggy. Welcome to this week's weather review and outlook. Soil temps did backslide in the east this past week, with some warming in the southern panhandle. Snow in the far northwest and rain elsewhere keeps much of the Nebraska state in a perpetual pruny state. After last week's drenching, more rain just kept falling over the same areas. Hoping for better probably won't get you much in this outlook. Saturday brings south winds, mild temps, and an abundant chance for rain for everyone. 60% chance in the east, 70% chance way west. Severe storms are also on tap for Saturday. Although a few tornadoes are possible, the main concern is for damaging winds and large hail. Sunday sees cooler air cycling in from the west. With the only highs in the 50s around Gordon, Fall City could see 80. Chance for rain throughout the state, with best chances in the northeast and Arthur and Keith County area. Monday brings north breezes to most, with lows in the 30s northwest and near 50s southeast. 60s for the high statewide. Slight chance of a shower by Binkelman and Trenton. Winds switch to the east southeast on Tuesday with 30s breaking out for lows across Nebraska's saddle. 50s in the northwest to near 70 southeast for highs. Best chances of rain in the panhandle and south central areas. We'll rename Wednesday to wet day with chances for rain statewide. 
near normal temps in the morning, warming to only 60s and 70s. Best chances of rain in the southeast, but everyone has a piece of the rain lottery ticket. A chance for refreshing dry on Thursday, starting a little cool in the 30s near Valentine, 40 southwest and 50s in the east. Everyone should see 60s for highs. A small chance of rain in the very southeast portion of the state. Friday sees the day starting in the 40s statewide and highs only in the 50s far west, 60s in the southeast. Chance of rain south of Kearney and again up along the Snake River. I was hoping for, to only mention soil temps as a concern for the first week while filling in for Al, but here we are at the end of my stint and soil temps are still struggling to meet basic bean germination requirements. And for the next week we're not seeing any headway in actual drops in the southern sand hills. A quick look at the Climate Prediction Center's 8 to 14 fantasy forecast is calling for persistence with lower than average temperatures. Still not catching on, their outlook calls for near normal precipitation for that same week. Thanks for tuning in. If Al can find the oars for his boat, he'll be back next week for your weather outlook. Thanks, Stoney. Today's interviews can be found on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on the USDA's May crop report, corn diseases, insects in corn, and Japan's use of imported grains. As always, you can follow Market Journal during the week on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Next week, Ron Plain will join us to analyze hog markets, Lauren Giesler will discuss seedling diseases in soybeans, and we'll explore how the Trans-Pacific Partnership could impact Nebraska's ag trade with Japan. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board and the Nebraska Soybean Board. No matter how you look at it, animal agriculture helps Nebraska's economy. The livestock industry provides increased tax revenues for schools and community services. Livestock enterprises also create jobs while contributing to existing businesses such as local banks and grocery stores. A thriving livestock industry helps maintain our current way of life, but also provides opportunities for the next generation of farm families. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff helps to raise awareness of the importance of animal agriculture to Nebraska.